So uh, we are ready to start our first session, which is called um, Living on the Edge. Uh, I'm Shuman Banerjee. I'm from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and um, request all of you to kindly uh, uh, get seated and get ready for the session. So the organizers also asked me to let people know that uh, we will be roughly running 30 minutes late. So everything today is going to slide by 30 minutes. So that's the information I was asked to share with you all. So let's uh, jump ahead and uh, get into our first uh, presentation uh, of this session today, uh, which is being given by Justin Chan. Justin is a graduate student at the University of Washington, advised by Shyam Golakota. And uh, over to Justin. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm Justin Chan from the University of Washington, and today I'll be talking to you about an underexplored area to enable wireless networking using conductive surfaces. So existing wireless protocols today, like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and cellular assistive, have enabled truly untethered mobility by focusing on far-field electromagnetic radiation. However, this ignores a large class of use cases. Specifically, when mobile devices like smartphones or smartwatches are, are not in pockets or bags, they're often placed on a common surface like a tabletop. Similarly, IoT devices are often placed on shelves or mounted on walls. In this talk, we explore the idea of leveraging common surfaces like walls and tables to augment the wireless capabilities of devices. We ask ourselves the following question. Can we achieve high data rate communication when devices come in contact with the same surface? The fundamental challenge is that surfaces like tables and walls cannot facilitate wireless propagation. So specifically, wood, sheetrock, and plastic are not conductive and cannot be used to propagate RF communication. Our approach is to coat these surfaces with the material that can, in fact, uh, propagate RF signals. So we explore two minimally invasive options. The first option is conductive spray paint. So I have here with me uh, two pieces of wood, uh, one coated with copper and one coated with silver conductive spray paint. And you can imagine this being coated in a different color to fit its surrounding environment. The second option that we present is conductive cloth that can be used as a tablecloth or as a scarf like what I'm wearing now. In our experiments, we show that these materials can in fact be used for wireless communication. To make contact with these surfaces, we use a standard SMA connector with a tiny pin that has a diameter of eight millimeters. So as you can see here, the figure on the left shows the SMA connector when it is touching the surface. In this case, a piece of paper spray painted with silver conductive spray paint. And on the right, we see the contact not touching the surface. So we know that our connector actually works across a variety of substrates, including paper, plastic, wood, and sheetrock. And for our application scenarios, we would have a smartphone, uh, the weight of a smartphone actually weigh down the connector so it makes good contact with the surface. The first question we have to ask here is, do these conductive surfaces actually propagate RF signals? To test this, we have a 16 feet long test bed, which is a large sheet of paper coated with conductive spray paint. We then measure the received power of a signal along different distances of this spray paint and see what the received power is like. And we know that the transmitter and the receiver do not share a common ground. So here is the attenuation over distance when the contacts are touching the surface. So we do this at three different frequencies, 900 megahertz, 2.4, and 5 gigahertz. And as you can see, the attenuation between frequencies is uh, quite similar. And the main takeaway here is that these surfaces can, in fact, facilitate communication in the ISM band. Now, we show what happens when we remove these surfaces, remove these contacts from the surfaces. 
That is, the communication is just occurring over the air between the SMA contacts. And as you can see, the signal strength here is actually close to noise, which shows that the communication is due to contact with the surface. The results are similar for conductive cloth, and the results are in the paper. The second question we ask is what happens when we place objects on the surface? We do this for a uncluttered piece of conductive cloth, like on the left, and a very cluttered piece of conductive cloth on the right. We analyze the multipath properties by sending a brief one nanosecond pulse through the cloth and look at the received signal. So the plot on the left shows the multipath profile for the uncluttered sheet of conductive cloth. And you can see there is, in fact, significant multipath, and there is noise even 300 nanoseconds after the initial pulse is sent. Here is the multipath for the cluttered piece of conductive cloth, and you can see there's even more noise. We note here that the multipath profile is similar even for different configurations of objects on the surface, and even when humans are touching the surface. In spite of this noise, the delay spread for the multipath profile is about 50 to 100 nanoseconds. And this means that an OFDM cyclic prefix can deal with the intersymbol interference. For the rest of the talk, I want to introduce two new communication primitives that we can enable with this surface design. The first primitive is surface MIMO. So surface MIMO is a technique that enables MIMO for small, single antenna devices that share the same surface. And the second primitive is a gigabit communication scheme um, that works across these surfaces using off-the-shelf Wi-Fi cards. So I'll first talk about surface MIMO. Traditional MIMO relies on multiple antennas at transmitters or receivers to get high throughput gains. And this is OK for desktops and laptops, which are large enough to house these multiple antennas. But for small mobile devices like smartphones and smartwatches, their physical size intrinsically limits the number of antennas they can support. So for many of these devices, they only contain a single Wi-Fi antenna and cannot get MIMO throughput gains. Our key insight here is that when these devices share the same surface, they can exploit the surface itself as an additional spatial path and achieve MIMO gains. So take, for example, two smartphones that are resting on the same tablecloth. Right now, they can only transmit over the air with their PCB trace antennas. But with surface MIMO, they can leverage the tablecloth itself as an additional spatial path to pretty much double its throughputs and rapidly share large files like photos and videos. In another example, a laptop can rapidly back up files to an external single antenna hard disk just by being in contact with the same surface. So the way that traditional MIMO works is that it leverages multipath to get its throughput gains. What this, mean, what this means is that antennas actually have to be separated by half a wavelength, which in the case of 2.4 gigahertz is 6.25 centimeters, which is simply too large for most mobile devices. And if you decrease the antenna separation, the MIMO streams become too correlated and you will not be able to see your throughput gains. But with surface MIMO, we can actually get MIMO throughput gains with just a one centimeter separation between the antenna and the surface contact. So why is this? The reason for this is that RF signals that propagate through the surface actually propagate at a lower velocity compared to over-the-air transmissions. And they reach the receiver with a different phase and amplitude, creating a path that is independent of the over-the-air transmissions. Additionally, even if you have only a transmitter or only a receiver on the surface, you will still be able to achieve MIMO diversity gains um, with just a one centimeter separation. We provide a more detailed theoretical analysis in our paper if you're interested, but now I'd like to show you our empirical results. So how well does surface MIMO work in practice? To do this, we measure the UDP throughput at 2.4 gigahertz for four different wireless systems. So the first system here is a over-the-air, single transmitter, single receiver system. And then we measure the, the throughput over distance. The second system is a traditional over-the-air, two-by-two MIMO system using PCB trace antennas that are typically found on mobile phones. And the separation between these antennas is half a wavelength, or 6.25 centimeters. 
The third system that we measure is our two by two surface MIMO setup with a single PCB trace antenna and a single contact with just a one centimeter separation. We measure this over conductive spray paint when there are no objects on the surface and when there are objects on the surface. So here the throughput's over 16 feet for our single transmitter, single receiver system. And here are the throughputs for our traditional 2x2 two two MIMO system. And as expected, the throughputs are higher. Now let's plot our surface MIMO throughputs. As you can see, even with just a one centimeter separation, we can actually get higher throughputs across almost all distances compared to traditional MIMO. So why are we doing better than traditional MIMO? There are two reasons for this, and the first is that our surface actually acts like an antenna that provides us with a larger gain compared to PCB trace antennas. The second reason for this is that the multipath on the surface is actually larger than the multipath over the air, allowing us to achieve higher MIMO throughput gains. Finally, we cluttered the surface with various objects and measured the throughput. Here are the results, and as you can see, there are actually no noticeable differences when we add objects on the surface. And the reason is that objects on the surface do not decrease the SNR of over-the-air transmissions, and they do not attenuate signals that are transmitted through the surface. Here are a summary of our throughput gains. For our 2 by 2 surface MIMO system, we get a 2.6 times throughput gain compared to a single transmitter, single receiver system, and a 1.2x gain over traditional MIMO. For a 3x3 three three surface MIMO system, we get a three times gain over a single transmitter, single receiver system, and a 1.3x gain compared to traditional MIMO. Now I'd like to talk about our second primitive, enabling gigabit communication across these surfaces. If you could transmit at gigabit speeds across these surfaces, a virtual reality headset could actually stream video through a conductive hoodie to a wearable pack, and this negates the need for a wire to tether the two devices. In another example, HD cameras mounted on walls could stream video through the conductive wall to a single shared plugged-in uh, media hub. We achieve this by stitching together 20 and 40 megahertz channels in the ISM band. We combine transmissions at 900 megahertz, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz into a single tiny surface contact. By using off-the-shelf Wi-Fi cards, we can use their onboard carrier sense algorithm to ensure that multiple of these radios can transmit and receive on these surfaces concurrently. So, Given that we're transmitting concurrently across so many different bands, you might be asking yourself, doesn't this cause a lot of interference to existing on-air transmissions? To investigate this, we look at three cases. We look at um, the emissions of a monopole antenna when we're transmitting at 2.4 gigahertz, and then we put a USRP in contact with the surface and measure the received power in front of the surface and behind the surface. So when the transmitter is our monopole antenna, the received power is actually symmetric around the entire antenna with an average power of negative 26 dBm. But when the transmitter is the surface, the received power actually depends on where the receiver is placed. So when the receiver is in front of the surface, we get an attenuation of 13 dB compared to the regular monopole antenna. When we place the receiver behind the surface, we get an even better attenuation of 25 dB, which shows that our surfaces actually interfere less compared to monopole antennas. So when two devices share the same surface, it's actually better for them to use the surface for communication. Finally, I want to show you the capacities we can actually achieve on these surfaces. We place one of our Wi-Fi AP prototypes as a transmitter, and one is the receiver, and measure the link rates over different distances. We actually find for conductive spray paint and for conductive cloth, the link rates are 776 megabits per second to 1.27 gigabits per second across the whole length of the surface, thus showing we can achieve gigabit communication. In conclusion, we present a detailed characterization of conductive paint and cloth for communication, 
Secondly, we enable MIMO communication for small single antenna devices that share the same conductive surface. And finally, we present the first communication design to support a gigabit data rates across these surfaces. That is the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. Okay, I think uh, let's thank our speaker again. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Peijian Guo from um, uh, Yale University. Uh, he is a fourth year PhD student advised by Wenjin Hu and uh, he's going to tell us about a system called Foggy Cache. So over to you. So thanks for the introduction. And uh, today I'm very happy to present our work Foggy Cache cross-device approximate computation reuse. Nowadays, learning-based mobile and IoT applications are increasingly popular. These applications are widely used for smart home, cognitive assistance, and even intelligent agriculture. Meanwhile, these applications are also very computation intensive, and therefore either incur additional uploading latency or drain the device battery if running locally. Further, the issue gets even worse when nearby devices run the same popular app repeatedly. For example, landmark recognition as a core function for many cognitive assistance apps are likely to be invoked by the nearby devices around the famous landmark to search for its related information. However, if we look more closely, we can see that actually these computation requests are actually redundant. Even though the following three images are not identical, they all capture the same building and therefore map to the same recognition result, which is the Sterling Library. Further, we sample images from Google Street View under certain de device density, and uh, a simple estimate shows that up to 82% of the input are actually correlated, which generates the same recognition result. And this implies there's a lot of redundancy. Here's another example in smart home scenario. There are a set of common commands that are likely to be used by different users throughout the day multiple times, such as turn on the light or play some music. Even though these raw signals are not identical, they would map to the same audio command, so there's no need to repeatedly invoke the whole speech recognition process. Therefore, a natural question would be, can we eliminate such redundancy across devices? A simple answer is, we should reuse previous computation results. And there are existing works about computation reuse that follow the idea. But unfortunately, these approaches don't work for our cases. The following figure provides the reason. If the same input appears repeatedly, then the the previous computation results can be reused for future input by cache lookup. However, if the input are similar to each other but not strictly identical, which is the most of the cases according to our examples, then there is no reusable data can be retrieved simply by cache lookup. Ideally, what we want is to look up computation records with very similar input from the cache, and then to find the reusable results from them. And this brings up our work, Approximate Computation Reuse. In general, our goal is to design algorithms to achieve approximate computation reuse, and we further build a system that implements the idea to eliminate redundancy across devices. Okay, now let's start with the overall reuse process. Different from traditional computation reuse, approximate reuse involves two essential steps. The first is to look up computation records with very similar input. Notice that the input data are often high dimensional. This makes fast and accurate lookup very challenging. And further, the second step is to determine the reuse outcome from these similar records. And therefore, in the rest of the talk, I will first explain the two algorithms, then discuss the system design, and finally show the system performance. Now, suppose we have a bunch of images from handwritten digits from MNIST dataset. 
These images are essentially represented as high dimensional vectors and along with their recognition labels are stored in the cache. And then we also have the query input marked with red border. And now what we want is to look up the computation records with the most similar input. To achieve fast lookup, a basic Strowman solution is locality sensitive hashing. What it does is that it uses a set of hash functions to partition the whole space into subspaces. Each of the subspaces performs as a hash bucket, and so that more similar data stay in the same bucket with higher probability, whereas dissimilar data stay in different buckets. And then once a query maps to a certain bucket, then all similar records within that bucket will be retrieved. However, the basic OSH algorithm is not enough. Now suppose we have two OSH data structures and they are conf initially configured with the same fixed bucket size. Then if the data distribution is dense, then it's likely that multiple cluster of digits, say four, six, and nine, stay within the same hash bucket, and this would significantly increase the lookup time because many irrelevant data are also re retrieved. Whereas if the data distribution is sparse, a single cluster of digits could spread across multiple hash bucket, and in this case, we might miss actually similar records if we only look into a single hash bucket. And in summary, the problem is the conflict between the static configuration and the dynamic data distribution. And this problem brings up our algorithm, adaptive OSH, which essentially adapts the bucket size to real-time data distribution. For example, under certain data distribution shown in the figure, the proper bucket setting should be within the range to guarantee a accurate lookup. And therefore, our first step is to capture the input data distribution. And we do that by first gather the, the, all the records in the cache into clusters according to their recognition label. And then we calculate the intercluster and intracluster distance on average and use the ratio to characterize the input data distribution. And also notice that the bucket size also affects lookup time. And so the second step of our algorithm is to adapt the bucket size jointly considering the, ra the ratio which captures the input data distribution and the lookup time target. And in summary, adaptive LSH runs periodically offline to tune the LSH bucket sa size to the real time data distribution. Now we've explained how to do the lookup. The next step would be to determine the reuse outcome. To do that, a simplest approach is k-nearest neighbor. To be specific, we also gather the records, the most nearest records into clusters according to their label, and then we take the result label of the largest cluster as a reuse outcome, and corresponding to the figure is digit nine. But however, the basic k-n is far from enough to meet all we need. Essentially, the label of the largest cluster is not always the desirable reuse result, and more importantly, there is no way to de detect the likelihood. For example, if a query input is located at the border of two cluster of digits, then it's super hard to ensure that the largest cluster always accurate for the query input. And further, Different applications such as PO recognition or Google Lens will have different preference on the trade-off between the reuse accuracy versus saving more computation. And basic KN does not provide us control over the trade-off. To tackle the challenge, we need to see what is needed beyond basic KN. So essentially, we need to gauge the dominance level of the largest cluster. But why dominance level? The following figure provides the insight. Comparing the following two reuse cases, it's easy to tell that the case in the right is more likely to be accurate because almost all of its records belong to the same cluster, digit nine. And in other words, we believe that a more dominant cluster implies more confidence of accurate reuse. And then the dominance level can also be used as the signal to customize the reuse trade-off. Okay, now 
to really quantify the dominance level of a cluster, we propose a metric called homogeneity factor. Starting from the Kenyon's neighbor, we, we first gather the records also into clusters according to their label, and then we further form a vector from the cluster sizes. And the factor theta is defined as the cosine between the vector and its largest dimension, which, which represents the size of the largest cluster. And in this way, a high theta would mean a large dominant cluster, and which further implies a high confidence of correct reuse. Oops. Okay, putting it all together, our homogenized KN algorithm works as follows. We first calculate the homogeneity factor theta, and then we compare the data with a predefined threshold, and we only do the reuse once the factor data is over the threshold. And in this case, the trade-off between the reuse accuracy versus saving computation can be controlled by setting a proper value of the threshold. Now, let's move on to the foggy cache system design. Foggy cache intercepts at library level making it transparent to the upper level applications. And the focus cache itself internally will determine if we can do approximate reuse or find it not reusable and call the native processing library to do the computation. Further, the cache is deployed at both edge and the client. The, the cache on the server side performs as the central point to gather and share the computation records across different devices, whereas the local cache is used to accelerate, lo uh, to accelerate local reuse. Further, we made some optimizations for the server and cache synchronization, which is a key, performan a key performance factor. We have stratified sampling to populate client cache to maximize reuse opportunity, and we deploy a speculative execution mechanisms on the server side to estimate the importance of certain computation vectors and to pre-compute results that might be reused. Now let's take a look at the system performance. For the general setup, we use Linux desktop as the server, and we use Google Nexus 9 tablet as the dev mobile devices. The workloads and data sets cover both visual and audio use cases. First, the following figure shows the trade-off between the reuse accuracy versus saving computation. And we show, we show the percentage of total time saved versus homogeneity threshold. Further, we also draw the relationship with the reuse accuracy. And we can see from the figure that the trade-off can be effectively tuned by setting to different homogeneity threshold. Further. Here's the end-to-end -end performance numbers. We compare the latency, energy consumption, and the accuracy for the following three workloads with and without foggy cache support. From the numbers, we can see we, with foggy cache support, we achieve over three times latency reduction, up to 10 times battery usage reduction, and with only less than 5% accuracy loss. To conclude, we build foggy cache system for cross-device approximate computation reuse, which effectively eliminates fuzzy redundancy across devices. Further, we believe approximate computation reuse as a promising new direction for optimizations, and the algorithms are generically applicable to other scenarios. Thank you. So we move on to the third talk of the session, and uh, we have Karthik Sundaresan, who's uh, from NEC Labs, he's going to tell us about a system they call SkyCore. Uh, he's going to have flying uh, unmanned vehicles, doing LTE, and much more. So over to Karthik. Thanks for the kind introduction, Suman. Uh, this is a joint work with some of my colleagues from NEC, as well as an enterprising student from University of Michigan, Mehrdad who's unable to be here today. He was very excited to present this work, but he has graduated and taken up a job, uh, so he's unable to make it. So let me set the context for this work. So we've heard a lot about mobile and cellular networks this morning, and we do see that mobile networks are growing in abundance, and what I mean with that is there's a lot more sophistication, a lot more features are coming into mobile networks. We are on our way to the fifth generation of cellular networks with a lot more sophistication. And one of the key questions that still remains is, uh, these are abundant, but are they 
truly ubiquitous. And what I mean by ubiquitous uh, is that we are often faced with a lot of climatic events, natural disasters, a lot of scenarios where the networks are stressed, uh, stressed and they are congested. And often in these scenarios, we do face a lot of issues with respect to availability of the mobile networks themselves. And we've seen this too many times recently with the Indonesian earthquake, uh, which triggered a tsunami. The mobile systems were down. The cellular infrastructure was affected from the earthquake, which prevented the SMS alerts from going out to people, warning them of the tsunami. And recently, Hurricane Michael in the US generated a lot of damage to the networks that were down for almost a week after the event itself. So we do have some solutions to take care of some of these events today. And uh, we have solutions where the federal government in the US is coming up with a separate initiative where they're upgrading their first responder network to deal in such kind of scenarios. They have a separate network that will be deployed based off LTE or maybe upgraded to 5G in the future, where first responders can use dedicated spectrum for communication and reconnaissance and stuff after these events. So that is a great effort. And likewise, operators themselves have some on-demand efforts like sell on wheels, which they deploy in such needs to be able to cater to such relief efforts. But oftentimes, as you can see, a lot of these things are fairly limited in terms of their flexibility, their agility, and also their availability. In a lot of the scenarios, the infrastructure is still static, and although the infra spectrum is dedicated, the infrastructure itself is susceptible to all the natural events and disasters. So what we really need is an on-demand mobile network that is capable of very rapid deployment, completely self-organization and self-configuration so that you can meet these challenged environments. And what is our vision towards addressing this challenge? So one of the visions we've had was to see if we could really beam connectivity from the sky. So we've had a lot of advances in the unmanned aerial uh, vehicle networks recently, and they're becoming more commoditized. They're available for a very affordable price point, and they have a lot more functionality in there. Now the question is, can we deploy an on-demand, uh, which is very rapidly deployable, highly flexible, agile, self-configurable, airborne LTE network from the sky? And when I say a network, it's not just a single UAV flying, but a network of UAVs, UAVs that can deliver LTE connectivity from the sky. So these could be operating in a supplementary model. They could add on as small cells that are deployed and connect your existing macro cell infrastructure when they're available, or they could also be deployed in a completely standalone fashion. When your infrastructure is completely uh, destroyed, you could have a completely standalone network spanning several miles that can provide connectivity between first responders and public that are facing themselves, finding themselves in such scenarios. And what's ushering in this sort of a vision is also some of the other trends that are happening. We don't necessarily need the operators to deploy their price spectrum for this. Uh, we have a lot of newer spectrums that the governments are opening up for innovation. For example, it's the 3.5 gigahertz CBRS bands in the US where even public can deploy LTE networks. So there are a lot of such innovations happening that makes smaller greenfield operators who can deploy their own private LTE networks. And of course, the Achilles heel of any drone network or UAV network is its battery lifetime. And there are a lot of very promising startups that are trying to address this problem um, on a front row basis. They are coming up with a lot of interesting wireless charging solutions that will allow us to keep these drones up in the air without having to ground them for recharging. So a lot of these things are enabling or going to be a part of this integral vision. And operators are also having or going on with their own trial efforts where they've deployed small scale single drone kind of LT connectivity. Although limited in scale, they're still trying and saying how much can this vision be pushed. So the key question is how easy or how challenging is it problem? Why can't we just slap on an LTE radio onto a UAV and just let it fly? Is it as simple as that? So the answer is actually a little bit more complicated in practice. And one of the key reasons why it's complicated is just the sheer machinery that goes behind your cellular network. Your cellular network not just has your wireless link that your phones see, but there's a lot of orchestration in the form of the core network that sits behind this access network. That orchestra orchestrates every time, from the time your goes from active, uh, idle to active mode, everything is set up and managed, including your mobility, your security, authentication, and all the other things that happen behind the scenes is orchestrated by a high-speed wired network called the core network. And of course, the different base stations and these gateway elements are all connected by a high-speed backhaul wired network. So there are these three different components that form your mobile network. And the question is, how do you take this huge beast and deploy it on a, something as fragile as a UAV? 
right? So our solution to this is a much broader vision than what this talk itself is gonna uh, uh, present. So our solution to this is what is known as a system called Skylight. So as the name suggests, it's about being able to beam LTE from the sky, and it comes, consists of three essential components that make up the system. So we have a component that will take care of how the UAVs self-position and organize themselves to create these small cells to provide optimized connectivity. We'll have a core network which orchestrates and puts this entire core network in a lightweight and resource efficient fashion on each of the UAV platforms. And also a backhaul network that takes into account that your UAVs could move around and I still need to maintain a high gigabit per second capacity between these different drones to enable this widespread network. So what this talk is gonna be about is the core part of it itself. So what is it with the core that makes it really challenging? So the core has a whole bunch of network elements that take care of all the different functionalities I mentioned, starting from mobility, routing, authentication, setup and teardown of all the connections. And the question is, today, even operators don't know how effectively to apply this in this particular challenging environment. Where do we place this core network? Do we place it on the UAV? Do we place it on the ground? How do we make it scalable? So these are all questions that arise, right? And our job as part of this work is to address some of these challenges and put forth a design that will help enable this kind of a system. So what are some of these challenges? So the way operators are looking at it is, can I take an existing EPC design without having to change it, just deploy it in this environment? One way to do it is, I deploy it on the ground, I need to send a lot of data to the base stations, I'll just hook up through a tethered wire to the drone itself. And as you can see, that is a possible solution with very little effort but that it does have its own limitations. Um, of course, the reason we are going for the UAV is to have flexibility and having it tethered completely defeats the purpose. The other option, a more uh, sensible one, is to have the EPC on the ground but still have the connection to the base stations or the RAN network through wireless. So that's definitely a possibility and that's something that the operators are trying as well. And this allows you to scale because you don't have to send a wire from a ground station to every single drone. So you now have a wireless link and you can scale it to multiple drones. But the challenge with that is the wireless is now on the critical path between your RAN and the core network. So if you take today's networks, it is a high speed reliable wired network. And now we are introducing a wireless link between the RAN and the core where all your critical control plane functions are gonna reside. And that becomes a huge challenge. If you look at some of the retransmission numbers here, this uh, points, out, points to the fact that a lot of retransmission that are gonna happen on your control plane which could completely stall your connections and your user experience eventually. And of course, not to mention, the connectivity between the ground station and your UAVs could often switch between line of sight and non-line of sight conditions, and that complicates uh, conditions for uh, operation of the network itself. So what SkyCore advocates for is a completely radical design. Uh, it advocates for completely pushing the core network to the real edge of the network. And when I say edge, we are really pushing it to the base stations themselves. Can I deploy a core network instance right on each of the UAVs? And what are the challenges in doing this? So if you could do this, you would take away all the challenges I discussed so far that come with just taking legacy EPC designs and deploying it in this environment. But the challenge is now you have to redesign the whole system and the question is how do you go about doing that? So it doesn't come without its fair shell of challenges. Taking a heavyweight machinery like a core network and putting it on a UAV is highly resource challenging. So the UAV platforms are highly resource uh, challenged and now you want to put a very compute uh, draining network such as the core network protocols onto a UAV makes it very challenging for us to deploy it. This has a direct impact on increasing the control plane overhead, both in terms of the latencies that the user would see from the time of setting up connections and during mobility and handovers, but also in terms of just the compute usage on the platform itself. And of course, Mobility is not just a simple event as in the users moving. In our case, the network infrastructure itself could move. The drones which serve as the base stations would themselves be moving around and that's, this creates a lot of mobility events. And now today in our networks, your EPC, a single EPC manages several cities or even several states. So you hardly have an event where a user moves from one EPC instance to another EPC instance. And if at all that happens, you would break the connection and then make it. So you will see a glitch in user performance. But in our scenario, with the EPC being pushed to the real edge at the base station, 
there's going to be a lot of such EPC breakages and makeages, which is going to completely destroy user experience. So today we don't have this functionality of enabling inter-EPC handoffs. So we need to enable that in our context. So there are two main design components, if you will, for SkyCore that really address these challenges. Uh, I will not go into the details of them, but just point at a high level in the interest of time. Feel free to take a look at the paper for more details. But the two essential components are one of them deals with how do we make the code design very resource efficient, and the other is about enabling this inter-EPC or inter-agent communication so that you can have seamless functionality in this environment. So in terms of resource efficiency, what we are tackling is we come up with a way of how do we take this whole EPC network and its protocols and refactor it in software completely so that you can make it very lightweight and resource efficient. And the way we do it is we first decouple, go for an SDN-based approach where we decouple the control and the data plane functionality. Once we do that, we then start consolidating all the distributed interfaces and protocols and make them into simple lightweight SDN or software-defined network applications such that they can be made very compact and resource efficient. And we do that for all, all of the different functionality. For example, we do it for the control plane, where we take all of these, for example, there's a serving gateway and there is a packet gateway control plane element functionality. You consolidate it into a simple application called an LTE policy application. You can do a similar thing for the LTE mobility application. And we also introduce new applications that are specific to the UAV context, where the control of the drone or the movement of the drone and the battery resources on it will interact with the SkyCore control agent for the UAV to know when it's time for the EPC state to be migrated to another UAV. We do that for the data plane as well. We take the forwarding gateways and consolidate them into a simple SkyCore switch, which is an SDN switch that forwards packets essentially uh, in the kernel space. And we, and we also create a lot of routing, a uh, lot of uh, switching based actions that take care of charging, firewall, and all the other functions that are needed. We also enable pre computed uh, uh, dictionaries, or if you will, in memory transaction processes, where we store a lot of the state uh, for the security and the QoS policies for all the users. So all these things are kept and maintained in a consistent fashion so that we can completely avoid all the dynamic overhead that's incurred across these wireless links in the air. So we collapse, and then we pre-compute a lot of these profiles. And finally, this allows us to eliminate all the heavyweight interfaces and protocols, like all the GTP tunneling and headers and uh, overhead associated with it can be eliminated. All the uh, pro diameter signaling protocols can also be eliminated, making it very lightweight. The, the second component is essentially the inter-EPC communication. So what this does is we enable a seamless control plane protocol between multiple EPC agents on each of the drones. And we have proactive updates that proactively synchronize states instead of reactively responding to mobility. Because our UAV to UAV links are wireless, which are on the critical path. We don't want wireless to be on the critical path of control plane functionality, even if it is mobility. And so having proactive synchronization of states takes care of that issue. So we also have a, a novel uh, segment-based routing protocol that scales to multiple UAVs. Because one of the challenges today is you cannot create per session or per UE to UE uh, kind of tunnels, because these incur a significant amount of overhead. And given the vast amount of mobility in our environment, we cannot afford to keep adding the overhead for every single mobility event. And so we have segment-based routing, where segments are created to aggregate a lot of sessions and a lot of UE traffic, such that the overhead is highly scalable across multiple UAVs. So the GTPs, we still work with all commercial UEs. So GTP is handled right when the connections come into the UAV, the first UAV. GT GTP is decapsulated and then segment-based routing takes over. And then finally, when the connection has to go to another UE on the last wireless link, that's when we introduce the GTP header again. There's no GTP anywhere inside the UAV network. So we've built a complete version of the system on multiple UAVs. The, the biggest accomplishment, if you will, is the fact that we've engineered it, that it can work with commercial base stations and also with commercial smartphones today. So we can have this first responder network for public safety, public safety that can be deployed today with commercial uh, base stations and commercial users. And there are a lot of results, and I'm actually out of time, so I don't have time to go into the results. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just give you a very small snapshot. My idea here was basically to tell you what SkyCore was about. We have a complete system demo here in the evening of Skylight itself with all its functionality. Do drop by to learn more about it. Uh, we've done a lot of experiments. All the details are in the paper. Uh, the results are fairly easy for you to understand. 
we show even in terms of basic functionality, our networks can work with existing macro cell networks in terms of connecting to, for example, Verizon or AT&T and deploy your own small cells. And, and we also show that you can enable a completely standalone setup where two users just connect to our own UAV network without going to the internet can enable video chat. And we show a complete timeline of what, is, what are the latencies incurred in each and every aspect of all these different functionalities that we've enabled. So all these details are there in the paper. And we also show how we can enable handoffs today. Uh, even existing lot of uh, software EPCs do not enable handoffs for you, but we've shown that even across two UAVs, when users move about, we can enable handoffs. So there are a lot more results in terms of how resource efficient it is, how much we can serve, uh, save in utilization and latency that really makes it uh, very resource efficient for deployment. Uh, so all these results are there in the paper, and if you want to see a demo, please come by in the evening during the demo session, and you can see Skylight in operation. We have some videos of it. So what we've done here is we've enabled Skycore, uh, which is a neat system uh, that allows you to deploy EPC in these challenged environments and can enable first responder communication even between users and first responders. It works with your existing base stations, with your existing UEs, and there are a lot of interesting design decisions in terms of how this distributed network is architected. And there are a lot more applicability of this. It doesn't have to be in the UAV context. Whenever you want to introduce unreliable links between RAN and the core, so such designs apply. And with that, thank you for your time. And our uh, final speaker for this introductory paper session is Professor Mo Lee. He's an associate professor at NTU Singapore, and he's going to tell us about what he calls uh, stitched Wi-Fi antennas. Over to Mo. Thank you for the uh, introduction. OK, so um, I'm very happy to be here talking about our recent uh, research work. Um, this is a collaborative work with my students, Ya Xiong, Yan Bo, and Jason. Um, uh, the first author, Ya Xiong, has uh, moved and uh, worked uh, with uh, Princeton uh, as a postdoc researcher. OK, so um, the work is about stitched Wi-Fi antenna. And the question that you may ask is, right, why do we want to stitch those antennas and make a big number of uh, antennas, right? Um, so the recent uh, movement in, the, in our research community, and we have been, um, um, it, it has been a heated uh, research area. People have been trying to make use of Wi-Fi, not only for communication purpose, but also for sensing, right? For sensing the environment dynamics. And the key rationale is that the signal reflect, reflected from people and objects in the environment will change the channel state, which can be estimated by the CSI information carried by the actual transmitted packet. And by learning that dynamics, we can infer um, various uh, activities and environment dynamics and supporting so many different applications. And perhaps half of our community has been working on this uh, idea. This, uh, uh, for example, um, Fadel and Dina have been working on this uh, seeing through walls using the Wi-Fi radio front end. And the uh, work from Sovik and Romy Roy on using the CSI for localization purpose. Um, Jay Shong and Kyle Jaminson's work on a retrack. Um, Shyam's work on using the Wi-Fi for identifying people's um, uh, gestures and activities. And Jennifer's work on learning the human dynamics with the CSI, et cetera, et cetera, right? So people have been working on that, and their work can be classified roughly into two types, right? One is learning-based, where people are using the CSI uh, information to characterize the wireless channel, and they just uh, treat the channel as a black box and apply different machine learning, uh, machine learning algorithms for mapping the CSI variations to infer the human motion, location, activity, et cetera. Another type of work is uh, building actual wireless channel propagation models to estimate the channel parameters, like the AOA, TOA, Doppler shift, et cetera, and that will give us the signal paths and their dynamics. And from there, we can estimate the motion, location, et cetera. Okay. But both type of works are inherently limited, actually, by the um, diversity that we have, the frequency diversity where we need to use a bigger, a wider bandwidth to observe the signal so we have a better time resolution, right? And also the spatial diversity where we need 
more antennas so we can have the observations from the different locations and we can have a better resolution in angles to, to distinguish the different incoming angles of the signal. Right. Actually, talking about the spatial diversity, that reminds me uh, my trip yesterday right, to Taj Mahal. Actually, I was so excited for coming to India for the first time, so I can't help going to the um, um, Taj Mahal before actually doing the business. So um, this is a picture that I've taken. And uh, actually, you can see that, right? This is an old Chinese-English saying, right? People mountain, people see, right? So I don't have a very good channel between me and the Taj Mahal. So I try to walk around and leverage the uh, spatial diversity so I can take pictures from different angles. And uh, thanks to that uh, diversity, I can occasionally get a picture with a clear um, channel, right? And if you imagine that, if I, we play MIMO, and do this uh, beam forming, we can perhaps recover this uh, better quality picture, or a better channel. Right? Um, um, so this is a joking, but um, I hope the very important point that I want to make is um, um, the spatial diversity plays a very important role. Uh, it can help us to, to actually better um, um, uh, understand the channel and, and then infer this uh, uh, environment from that. OK, so a key question for all of those works Actually, also key challenge is how we can improve the diversity, especially with the commodity Wi-Fi hardware. And we have been working along that line. Um, three years ago, we have been working on this uh, improving the frequency diversity where we combine the uh, CSI measurement from different frequency channels. And we can synthesize a wider frequency, a wider me a measurement with a wider bandwidth. And uh, today I'm bringing another work where we try to extend the number of antennas where we can harness more uh, spatial diversity. Okay. Um, so this is a current uh, commodity uh, Wi-Fi NIC network interface card. On the left is uh, ASRO's PCIe NIC, where you can see that we have three um, radio chains, and as a, as a result, we have three antennas. And on the right, this is a commercial AP. Um, it has six antennas, but actually um, there are two um, network interface cards. So for each card, still only three um, um, antennas. The key reason of having only three antennas is that the radio chains are very expensive. Okay? Um, it has a full implementation of signal processing from the radio front end to the modulation, demodulation, and coding, decoding. So it's uh, expensive, and in particularly when we put them on the same chip, it has become exponentially more expensive in engineering that because they will have these on-chip interferences between the radio chains. So it is very expensive of expanding the number of antennas. But a key observation for this work is um, we find that the radio chains are expensive, but the antenna elements themselves are cheap. So that allows us to actually extend the radio chains to different number of antennas. And as you can see on this uh, uh, slide, where we can use split to split the radio chain into different number of antennas. We use an external mi microcontroller to control the switching, and we connect it with the access point so we can control that. And this is a prototype system that we built on the right. So we can, that enable us to build low cost plug and play solution based on COTS hardware. And imagine that we have an application where we just quickly swipe through all those antennas, and then we can get um, CSI measurement with the full spatial diversity, and then we can recover um, like the angle of arrival with a much higher um, accuracy. Okay. So the key challenge of doing that is um, we have to do it very quickly. Okay. So the channel access interval between any two packets is actually 34 microseconds. Why, why this uh, 34? If you look at the, um, this, is a, this is a typical picture in your textbook, right? If you look at the um, uh, CSMA protocol, where the key factor that limits, that, that is the smallest time span between your consecutive transmissions is actually this uh, DIFS time, which is dynamic interframe space, which is uh, 34 microsecond. So if we can put all those operations into this 34 microsecond, then we can support switching to whatever com uh, combination of antennas for your transmitting or receiving packets. Okay. 
So we have to do that, and the architecture is like this. We have our hardware, um, where we have the Wi-Fi NIC connected to the antenna. We have to go through the Ethernet NIC to connect to the uh, MCU for control the um, antenna combinations. And they have to talk all the way beyond the PCI interface and to the Linux kernel. And we have to make sure that it's going very fast. If you look at the um, software stack, and we have separate driver for Wi-Fi um, interface and the Ethernet interface. And if we let them talk, we have to go all the way back to the user space where we use the sockets and we communicate in between. So for sending any actual Wi-Fi packet, we have to send a command which is encapsulated in an Ethernet socket and go all the way down to the Ethernet NIC. And that consumes a lot of time. In average, it's 277 microseconds according to our experiment. And actually, the real time for sending the command through the Ethernet cable is only 12 microseconds. So it gives us a lot of room for optimization and so we can reduce that. Okay. So the key idea is we let the drivers in the Linux kernel talk directly with each other. Okay. So if you look at the transmission, right? So the typical procedure is when we have a frame to be sent to the NIC, we let it go through this queue on the NIC. And at the same time in the driver, we keep a queue recording all those frames. And after a transmission is successful, we get the ACK and then we can use that ACK to dequeue that frame look, uh, 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 recorded in your uh, driver. And we modify that. We add an annotation field where we annotate the antenna combination that we want to use for, those, for sending those frames. And then we have an ACK. We go to the driver and we um, take the uh, frame out and then at the same time we load the antenna combination that is going to be used for sending the next packet and we let it directly go to the Arduino. Okay. Similarly, for receiving a packet, what the driver does is uh, in its IRQ handler, it handles the data frame and sends it to the upper layer. And we alter that, we put in our um, uh, processing queue here, we try to annotate that frame with its current um, antenna combination, and at the same time, we try to fetch the next antenna combi combination for receiving the next packet, and then we send this command to the Arduino. Okay. So that's a key idea, and now we let them talk, and there are some uh, challenges that we have to address, like how do we let it go as fast as possible? We try to build up this um, sketches beforehand instead of building it from scratch, and we can then put it in the Ethernet driver instead of in the user space, and whenever we need to send it a command, we just send it. And when receiving the command, the Arduino just uh, don't have to actually decode the full packet, just look at the header field, and it can match it to certain command for a certain combination of the antennas, which can be done very fast. And according to our experiment, you can see that the uh, time for Arduino processing can be reduced to as low as four microseconds. For the AP software, to five microseconds, roughly. And in total, the time for switching can be controlled to, between, uh, to below 34 microseconds for 95% of the time. Okay. And there are a lot of other things that we can consider, um, uh, like uh, when, what about the common packet fails during the transmission? or it arrived uh, after, actually it arrived after the packet has already been received, or it's uh, even later the switch is done after the full, the completion of the packet receivable. We have a special um, solutions to address that. I'm, I'm not going to the detail due to the time limit. And here I'm going to show you one example where we built a uh, phased array on top of SWAN. So basic idea is like what I mentioned. I let the radio chain rotate on different antenna combinations, and as a result, I can get all this CSM measurement over those antennas. And uh, we can build a larger antenna array. And we can build a linear array like I just showed in the prototype, but we know that linear arrays suffering from this um, ambiguity in telling the direction of the signal from back or the front. 
and also it doesn't have a good field of view. It's limited by 120 degree. So we built a uniform linear array instead, and by building that, we can have a 30, 360 degree um, view, and we have a better resolution. So here I have a video showing. Okay, um, I'm, I'm sorry I cannot show it here because of this uh, compatibility issue. So if you look at the result, um, with our um, UCA, we can improve a lot from the uh, traditional three antenna setting, and we can, for, uh, we can improve the AOA estimation error to down to 5.7 degree for 90 percentile estimation. And also if we make it for localization purpose, say we use uh, two such arrays to locate one Arduino ring device, we can improve the accuracy to down to 0 0.65 meters. Okay, so SWAN can be also used for many other applications uh, like uh, to improve the communication throughput. I'm just not going to the detail um, for the sake of the time. And here I just want to use the last maybe two, three minutes to introduce a little bit on this uh, ASROS CSI tool that we have developed in the past years. And actually SWAN is also built on top of this tool. So we have been working on this tool and we built it for into the uh, Linux kernel and that is later uh, transplanted into various different versions of the Linux into including the Ubuntu system for PC or laptop setting or OpenWRT for many commercial APs or the Nino for embedded devices. And they have been expanded by the um, um, people in this community for like the drones, the uh, 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 embedded uh, devices, etc. So we have this, uh, all those information about our tool, and it has been already used by more than 1,100 registered users from worldwide. Um, a lot of publications using our tool, including those in the SIGCOM, MOBICOM, um, Triple AI, etc. So I hope that you can also um, have an opportunity to, to make use of this tool. Here I just want to um, uh, maybe do a even harder uh, promotion. So um, compare with the current existing um, CSI tool on Intel 5, uh, 5300, we provide more resolution with 10-bit CSI measurement, um, 56 subcarriers, and we, we can work as, with a set of uh, NICs. And we did a small experiment where we combine, uh, we actually uh, connect one antenna from Intel 5300 and our um, ASROS interface card. We try to measure the same channel. And uh, this is a measurement result. And uh, you can see that actually we are giving a better resolution in terms of the uh, um, 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 granularity as well as its uh, accuracy. So I still have some slides, but uh, because of the time, so I have to uh, stop here. If you have interest, um, you're welcome to uh, drop by and uh, I can share with you more on this, uh, our uh, CCI tool. Okay, yeah, thank you.